I don't want to hold up the class starting. So whenever y'all are ready, enjoy conversation this morning, but we- May I just put something out there while we're on this call? Um, it's kind of a, a, a request or just think about, since this is creation care, maybe some of y'all are more interested than, than most in gardening, that sort of thing. I'm working with um, Barbara Love and Sandy Sellers on our memorial garden on just planning a cleanup day to get that cleaned up and weeded. And then they're working on some plantings and things that we can do in the garden. Uh, so we're planning two different kind of Saturday mornings. If, if you would be interested in spending a morning in the garden uh, doing some weeding or planting, would you just send me an email? I would you know, love to, to get a group of four or five people who would be interested in doing that. Mm -hmm. Be a nice way to spend the morning. Okay, thanks. Okay, well, I think um, we've got some folks uh, continuing to join, and that's great. Uh, but but we may get started. Um, I, I want to say thank you to Jane and to the other members of the Growing Together small group who um, and other uh, others from Creation Care who just. Uh, I bugged Jane a couple times about whether she could help with a class today, and she said yes. Um, so thank you, Jane. You know, it's, the timing was good for Earth Day, and um, this spring, up until this latest cold snap, the spring has just been so beautiful. Um, it, it it's uh, it's a good time for us to reflect on creation care. Jane, do you want to say anything before I do my little bit at the beginning? I think so. Um, yeah, I think I'd like to talk about the creation care team and what we're going to be presenting um, this morning. So uh, there has been some type of creation care team at First Presbyterian probably since the 90s. And um, yeah, I mean, there have been projects like solar panels that have been talked about for decades. So. <laughs> um, and, and that's one of the things that we do is we, you know, we work with the church to make sure that we are doing the best that we can to protect God's creation in the way that we manage our facilities, but also to educate um, our members about what they can do at home and, and then to, to reach out to help um, to partner with other communities who are doing the same thing. In fact, we have a great partnership coming up with um, the um, church across the street, um, Central United Methodist that I'm not gonna take time to tell you about now. So the creation care team recently um, learned about a, a new project that is put together by the Creation Care Collaborative and they're calling it Growing Together. And it is an educational program that, um, that they present monthly for five months and each month there's a different topic. And so some of us on the call have been part of that. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to review um, the last, the last um, class, if you will, that, that they presented and give you some of those, um, some of those learnings. Okay, that's all I'll say for now. Okay. All right, good. Well, uh, we're looking forward to it. I, that's that. Uh, when that small group started, we, uh, I was able to review some of what they were gonna be learning and it's just rich, um, rich information about uh, the environment and eco justice and um, practical applications. So uh, I'm looking forward to hearing what you all have to share. Let me start us off with a prayer and then I'm gonna do just a few minutes of, uh, of a little biblical reflection and then uh, we'll turn it back over to the, to the group. Um, let's, let's pray. Oh God, we give you thanks for your love and your care. And today we give you thanks, especially for, uh, creation and, uh, the beauty that, that it brings and the responsibility it brings as well. We thank you for the opportunity to reflect on the gift of creation, uh, and, and our role in it. Uh, open our ears, our hearts, our minds to hear what it is you would have us hear today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Um, all right, I, uh, I will start, start off by saying I am not um, an expert on the environment or creation care um, at all, um, but I did read a good article this week <laughs> that I want to talk about for just a second. Um, 
the Presbyterian Outlook, uh, you know, that it, around Earth Day, all kinds of great articles come out and videos and things like that. Um, and the, the um, Outlook had a great article this past week um, by George Fisher, who is an elder at, a, at Knox Presbyterian Church in Baltimore. And he's a professor emeritus of geology at Johns Hopkins. He wrote this great article about living covenantally and sustainably. And I just, and when I looked at what Jane and the group is going to talk about today, it just fit together so beautifully. So I want to talk for just a couple minutes about the biblical perspective on, um, on sustainable living. Um, I mean, that sounds like such a, a modern term, but it's really not. It's a biblical um, understanding of the land and of creation and uh, the gift that God has given us and the responsibility to care for it as well. Um, I want to show you a, a, a small a picture that um, my, uh, where is it? Um, hold on one second. Um, my sister, one of my sisters lives in Jordan. She works for the State Department there. Um, and this morning she sent me a photo from, um, taken from the far north of Jordan. This is the Sea of Galilee here. Um, and so she's in the north of Jordan looking across the Sea of Galilee. And it just is, I don't know how many of you all have had the opportunity to go to Israel or the Middle East and and see the landscape there, but it is um, it is a rocky, uh, difficult uh, landscape to cultivate. Um, dry desert areas, rocks, uh, lots of elevation, and then water um, in the desert, um, and all these biblical images of um, of streams in the desert and water um, giving way to green growing things. Um, when you're there and you see the landscape, it, it kind of brings into um, focus some of what the biblical uh, words about creation are. So I just wanted you to have a little picture in your mind, um, just happened to pop in my inbox today. Um, uh, so if you think about the Bible and uh, it starts off, we know with the story of creation and um, the, the Bible kind of emerged out of this um, agrarian community that so many of the stories are about uh, the land and about God's people uh, uh, making a living on the land, struggling to survive, holding on to the, their land and finding a place in it. Um, and, and as difficult it is, as it is to farm on that land, um, the, the biblical uh, narrative kind of tells us this covenant that God has given us um, between God and the people and the land. It's this three-way gift. Um, and we see it all through scripture. Um, in the Old Testament, we have stories like uh, Naboth's vineyard. King Ahab wanted a vegetable garden and he offered to buy this vineyard from Naboth, but who it was not easy to refuse a king who wanted to buy your land, but, um, but preserving the land for his family was, um, was a part of his covenantal understanding with God. And so uh, um, Naboth wrestled with that. In, in the book of Jeremiah, God um, it, it, we hear God's words indicting Judah for uh, kind of ruining the land, um, which, you know, he's kind of talking about you've broken the covenant, but also you've despoiled this beautiful fertile land into a desert that produces only thorns. And um, Jeremiah also has this moment where he, um, uh, his, his cousin um, in the midst of the exile wants Jeremiah to to buy land and keep it for the family. And Jeremiah knows he's not gonna be able to use that land himself, but he does, he buys the land and keeps it for future generations. So this idea that the land is a gift from God and that we, we are given this responsibility to maintain it and hold on to it. Um, and, it and that's part of God's gift of the covenant. In the New Testament, we've got all these parables from Jesus about uh, growing things and uh, metaphors for God's kingdom, and I could go on and on about the parable of the um, 
um, of the soil and the sower. And anyway, I don't want to take up Jane's time, but um, but this article, I'll put the link in um, in the chat. And if you're interested, you can read it. And it helped me understand as, as Creation Care and this group is going to talk a little bit about sustainable practices with the land, um, what we can do today, the God's people have been about that since the very beginning. Uh, in, and it's a part of our covenantal understanding of God's gift of creation to us. Um, so that's my bit. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Jane. Um, and I'll put the link to the article in the chat. Well, and thank you, Julie, for that that nice framing for this um, for this hour. And yes, that's what we're going to be talking about today: soil. Um, the the lesson that we're um, repeating is called regenerating soil, compost, and waste. And it really goes into the importance of waste. I'm sorry, the importance of soil. Um, in, in terms of how it can um, help our plants grow better, but also how it can store carbon underground. And in that, in that respect, it can uh, reverse climate change, help to reverse climate change. So um, what we'll be doing today is we'll be seeing two clips from the movie Kiss the Ground, which um, is a documentary that's been well publicized. Some of you may have seen it already. And um, I'm just going to right now ask Ruth if she will start us off with a prayer. O oh, divine planet, gift of God, you are our womb, our life, our body. We belong to you. Yet we confess our arrogant unbelonging. We have cut ourselves off from you. We ask forgiveness of the sea and soil of all that fly or swim or crawl, of all the green beings we have harmed. As you fill our stomachs with food and our lungs with life, fill our hearts with the will to be great, grafted back onto the vine, to participate fully, gently, and gratefully in the great dance of all living things. O oh, creating God, may we be like you, and one with you in giving life, in creating, not destroying. O living creator, O living creation, by your life in us, may we bloom with love and flourish in loveliness. Amen. Thank you, Ruth. So the first uh, clip that we'll see is called The Soil Story. And after that, we will have a breakout group um, before we see the second, the second clip. And Ann Kiefer will introduce um, us to this, to this clip. Ann, you're on mute. <laughs> sure I am. <laughs> Thanks. I had, I had barking dogs a while ago. Okay, so the creation care team at uh, First Press started gardening um, at the Black Mountain Home for Children at a garden that we called Homegrown Garden in 2010. And um, that was a faith-based volunteer effort that grew crops um, over the last several years, not including last year, which I'll get to. Um, and the crops were donated to a variety of, of different locations where food was available at no cost for or for people. Um, we were fortunate to be able to join a group of gardens that also grew food for donation, and that was called Gardens That Give. And there were some fantastic gardeners with lots of experience in that group, so we were able to learn very much from them and, um, we, and about caring for the soil. So sustainable agriculture or regenerative agriculture, as you may hear about it, describes farming and grazing practices that among other benefits, reverse climate change by rebuilding the soil's organic matter and restoring uh, degraded soil bi biodiversity, resulting in both carbon drawdown and improving the water cycle. So some of the practices that we were able 
uh, to learn through and, and uh, utilize in the homegrown garden were no-till gardening, com using compost and man manure, um, orga using organic pesticides and herbicides, using raised beds to reduce erosion, crop rotation, and, and growing cover crops. That's what happened last year. Because of the pandemic, our volunteer um, supply was shortened. And so uh, we grew a small crop of potatoes, but, but basically cover crops. Um, and mo but most importantly, what we learned is that the soil is not just a container that we put living seeds in. The soil is alive, too and it needs to be cared for. Um, so it, it, last year, Black Mountain Home approached us and they at that point had decided that they wanted to take over um, managing the garden. We're still welcome to go there as volunteers. They, it's been put into cover crop again this year, but um, they have um, hired people that can manage that now and it's a possible training opportunity for people there. Um, so we wanted our congregation to know what, what's happened there, uh, that, that it is now under new management. Um, so I think there's some exciting possibilities for the home in, in, in using that land and, and training some of their young people for future jobs. So I hope you'll enjoy learning more about the soil from which we were formed in which we will all return. Okay, Julie, we're ready to see um, the soil story now. Okay, I'll share this short clip with you. Can you see that? Yes. Yeah. My name is Passion Murray and I make compost in the city of Detroit. I want to share with you a story about soil, farming, and compost, and how it can be a solution for climate change. Climate change is a big problem. It's happening because there's too much carbon in our atmosphere, but carbon is not our enemy. It's the building block of life. Everything alive is made of it. It's us. The problem and the solution are a simple matter of balance. Let's step back and look at the five pools where carbon is stored on planet Earth. Starting about 500 million years ago, when plants came onto land, carbon began to cycle in an amazing balance, a balance that allowed for life as we know it to evolve. Then one life form, us, figured out how to extract carbon from the fossil pool. We've been burning it for energy, putting it into play, and disrupting that balance. How we manage land and do agriculture is moving even more carbon from the soil and biosphere into the atmosphere. Specifically, we've moved 880 gigatons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which is heating up the planet and destabilizing our climate. Now, the oceans have absorbed a lot of this excess carbon, which is resulting in warming temperatures, acidification, and accelerating a mass extinction of sea life. In order to stop global warming, of course we have to stop burning fossil carbon. The big question is, where do we put the excess carbon to get the cycle back in balance? Remember when I said that soil was a part of the solution? It literally is. Plants, with sunlight and water, perform photosynthesis. They pull carbon in from the air and turn it into carbohydrates, sugars. Then they pump some of those sugars down through their roots to feed microorganisms who use that carbon to build soil. There we go, carbon move. The plants pull it in and the soil stores it. Nature's living technology is amazing. Scientists have recently discovered that applying a thin layer of compost one time sets up an ongoing positive feedback loop that brings more and more carbon into the soil each year. In concert with our regenerative practices like not tilling the soil, planting trees and cover crops, and good grazing, we can build and retain gigatons of soil carbon. This is carbon farming. This is regenerative agriculture. More carbon in the ground is good for us. It makes healthy soil. Healthy soil makes for more nutritious food, and it holds way more water so crops are more resilient in the face of drought. That's good news for families, Farmers like me, 
and everyone that eats. The way we grow our food, fuel, and even our clothes either puts carbon into the atmosphere or pulls it down into the ground. The regeneration of soil is the task of our generation. Our health, the health of the soil, and the health of the planet are one and the same. Well, that was a, a quick explanation of the carbon cycle. <laughs> uh, what I want you to remember as we go into the breakout groups is the information that Ann gave us that we no longer have the um, community garden at the Black Mountain Home for Children. Um, so I, think, I, I just challenge you to think of other ways that as a church we can participate in helping to uh, preserve our soil and yeah, and, and farming it the right way. So uh, Julie, oh, the questions. Would you like me to put them in the chat box? I'm sorry. Uh, sure. Okay. Yeah, that'd be great, Jane. If. Uh, and I can send them to the breakout groom, groups okay. after that. Uh, so I think y'all are going to go to breakout groups. We got you're going to have a member of the um, growing together small group in your breakout room. Um, Jane, you want to just read the questions out, and then we'll. Sure. Uh, mm -hmm. First one: How do we live in right relationship with the land and with the soil? And the second. What does living in right relationship with land teach us about ourselves, about God, about the world, and about one another? Pretty, pretty deep questions. <laughs> um, all right, I'm gonna send you all to breakout rooms and the questions will head your way um, in the chat, uh, but uh, we'll spend about five or six minutes, I think, uh, talking about right relationship with the land because uh, we've got another clip to show you when you come back. That, I bet that's pretty rich. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I want to know which small group figured out how to live in right relationship with the land. And if you could teach that to the rest of us, that would be great. Or at least appreciate it very much. Yeah. I think we mostly talked about how we have not lived in right relationship. Yeah. Okay, well, we do have another um, video and actually in the group I was in, we already talked a little bit about compost. So this next, um, this next clip is uh, called The Compost Story and David will introduce this um, clip for us. Yeah. Thank you, Jane. Um, in living systems, uh, everything is regenerated. Uh, humans are the only creatures on the planet who create waste. Uh, waste then is a human uh, invention that upsets the natural balance of the ecosystems. And as we talk about the compost story, and it's a, a very nice uh, six minute video, um, I think it's important for us to recognize that this is really a critical time for us to uh, more aggressively embrace um, the aspect of composting and not just can we compost at home, but do we look at composting beyond our homes, uh, such as do we prefer to go to a restaurant that compost? Many do in Asheville. Um, do we try to support farms that are active in composting? Um, and eventually would we have a community that has a readily available, affordable ability to do curbside pickup of compost? Um, because not everyone can compost in their yard. Um, we've got two new puppies and last week they found two different uh, bear scats in the yard. And so if I had uh, a lot of food scraps in my backyard, my uh, dogs might have a closer encounter with the bear. Some people disagree about um, that, but uh, that'd be my, my concern. Uh, part of the compost story regard is also urgent is regarding the methane story. Um, we talk a lot and our first video talked a lot about carbon dioxide and it is accounts for about 95% of the green gas effect, but methane accounts for about 5%, but it is 80 times as potent in affecting um, global warming, green gas effect. Fortunately, methane 
unlike carbon dioxide doesn't break down in 200 years, it breaks down in about a decade. So as we're really trying to get our arms around global warming, a aggressive attack on methane, that 5%, is probably gonna pay us more dividends in our lifetime. The carbon dioxide story is gonna affect our grandchildren and our great grandchildren and the planet. And so when we look at methane, about a third of methane comes from uh, in the production of gas and um, oils and natural gas. Uh, the oil industry agreed in 2018 to reduce the leakage while they're producing down to 0.25% by 2025, and they've already achieved that. And they've, now they're gonna try to reduce that to 0.2% methane Right now, they make so much money, they can pull it out of the earth without worrying about that methane leakage. But could we force that industry to be even a little more thoughtful? Well, they've made progress. Other third comes from landfills. That's our food we throw in our garbage. That's a third of the methane that goes to the planet. And then another third comes from the agricultural industry, uh, largely in the large meat production. Um, so if we could embrace that composting to decrease what goes in our landfills, we could have an impact that we could see in our lifetime. So with that, I will let um, um, whoever's running the video to run uh, the compost story. Okay. Thank you, Julie. Yeah. All right, here we go. Have you ever looked at a banana peel and wondered, is that it? All that time spent nurturing the banana and now it's just waste? Could this humble peel serve a greater purpose? Currently in the US, over 60 billion pounds of mineral rich food material go to landfills each year. Imagine if we diverted those billions of pounds from the landfill and turned them into compost. Imagine our cities, vacant lots converted into food forests. Imagine abundance everywhere. And it can help reverse climate change. But most likely it won't. Why? Because we're insane. We define waste as anything unused, unproductive, or not properly utilized. But waste is a human invention. We're the only creatures on Earth who don't live a zero waste existence. Yep, thanks to trillions of microbes that are in and around everything, including us. Anything that lives gets repurposed and contributes to the growth of new life. Some 500 million years ago, these microbes brought plants onto the land. The microbes provided minerals and water in exchange for carbon sugars produced by the plants through photosynthesis. This resulted in a terrestrial explosion of life. More life meant more excretions and deaths, which meant more food and nutrients for decomposers, and all soil life, known as the soil food web. This increased the abundance and biodiversity of ecosystems and turned barren land into fertile soil. Today, Composting mimics this natural upcycling process, transforming combinations of organic material into life-filled, nutrient-available organic matter. Compost isn't just mulch, manure, or food waste on its own, nor does it stink. Compost has the aroma of the forest floor after a rain. It also has superpower. Compost can enhance food nutrition, increase crop yield, and strengthen plants' immune systems, all while increasing the soil's water holding capacity. And compost stimulates plant growth by bringing in microbial life, nutrients, and water retaining humus to depleted soils. More plant growth takes even more carbon out of the atmosphere. Microbes feed plants, plants feed microbes, and the self-regenerating soil carbon pump cycles on and on building soil. Compost is a regenerative substance. It isn't just fertilizer. It's an essential microbial source, a probiotic for the land beneath our feet. Now, while we've made some great progress recycling paper and even composting yard trimmings, currently in the US, over 50% of trash going to landfills is food scraps, paper, yard trimmings, and wood, all compostable materials. 
We are throwing away the very building blocks of life. Only 5% of our food scraps get composted. 5%. That means over 60 billion pounds of mineral-rich food material, much still fully edible. The weight of four and a half great Egyptian pyramids go to landfills each year. And there it rots, creating methane gas, a greenhouse gas up to 86 times more potent than CO2. And it's not just food. Grass, leaves, and clippings, all designed by nature to fall back to the ground and increase fertility, are shipped miles to landfill. Now, that's insane. Some city governments are finally stepping up by providing green bins to make composting more available, but too often, they're misused. Toxic material, trash, is being mixed with the stuff we grow our food in. Just stop it! Don't put toxins or non-organics in that bin, please! Our current agriculture system robs our soils of carbon and biology, replacing them with chemicals, leading to more degeneration and desertification. We've broken the regenerative loop of life. It's crazy. Without soil, life on land as we know it is impossible. And soil without life? It's just dust. If the soil has been stripped of its life-giving qualities, what can help save our future? Properly made compost. The soil would be spongy again, retaining water and restoring our underground water supplies. Fertile farms producing tastier and more nutritious food and no longer covered in toxic chemicals. Imagine a farm to table to compost to farm system. This is the regenerative system our future depends on. And doing it at home is easier than you think. You can at home, use your green bin. If you for some reason don't have a green bin, request one from your city or find a neighbor or community garden who can use your compostables. Cities like San Francisco, Los Angeles, St. Louis, and my hometown, New York, are leading the charge. Thank you. Countries from Haiti to Australia are using compost to address food security and desertification. Schools, hospitals, and restaurants are waking up to composting their food scraps. Scientists and compost manufacturers are improving methods, making our superhero even more powerful. Yes! Life isn't over for the humble peel. Along with other organic material, it can help restore fertility to our soil, regenerate our food systems, clean our water, and it can help reverse climate change. Really? Okay, so what can you do? Do all you can to support composting. If we're to keep the planet habitable, human beings must participate in regeneration. Each of us can play a role to help regenerate our planet simply by composting. The cycle of this can make or break us. You choose. Okay, another quick video there about composting. And I have put the questions for the breakout rooms in the chat. But before we go there, since one of the questions asks about what we can do as a church, um, I, wanna, I wanna update you on composting at, at FPC. So uh, we had been, we have been doing compost for a number of years. We started by the, the, uh, day, the, the daycare center. And we, um, we were not very pleased with Danny's dumpsters and the, the way that they handled our compost. So we now have a new contract with Atlas Organics. Um, Atlas Organics is actually based in Greenville. And I know there's a lot of carbon emissions coming from Greenville to Asheville to pick up our compost, but they're already picking up at UNC Asheville. So it's not like they're making a special trip. So, and I haven't, I'm very excited about it because we had you know, we had a lot of problems with leaking compost bins, um, just, you know, not being picked up when they should, overflowing, bad, bad stuff. So I'm really anxious to see the new ones um, when I go to church next Sunday. So I think we are then ready um, to go okay. into regular rooms. Yeah, I'll send you all, and Jane, put the questions in. As people of faith, what can we do individually? 
to reduce waste in landfills and support regenerative systems? And what could FBC Asheville do to encourage food practices that reduce food waste and support healthy soil and compost? Um, I'm going to be gone when you all get back, but Nancy's going to help um, help you all after that. So um, great. Here you go. Was it enough time to solve it all? <laughs> Not really, huh? <laughs> I, I think I hit one of my buttons sooner than everybody else, so they may still be talking. Here we go. Right. I was in the middle of talking in one of my small groups and hit the button and left <laughs> here we are. Students. Where's everybody? There's Jane. Okay, well, um, we had a, 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 good, a good conversation, even though we didn't get to the second question, we answered it. So um, yeah, I'm curious from all of you, if, if you discussed what we can do at, at our church to um, encourage food practices that reduce food waste and support healthy soil and compost. This, is, this would be really um, useful information for the creation care team. Well, we did have a question as to whether or not individual church members could be encouraged to bring their compost to the church and put it into the church collection barrel um, on Sunday morning so we wouldn't make an extra trip. And if that's possible with the new contract, we would have to find out. Yes. And um, that was brought up before. And the reason we were not able to allow it is that our church produces more than enough compost. <laughs> so we, um, we, we, couldn't, we couldn't ask the church, we couldn't invite the church members to bring their compost too. Um, but we did have a good suggestion in our group and that is to find um, a farm, maybe a, a nearby farm or um, an individual, even someone who could use our personal compost. Or, or to make community gardens um encourage community gardens to uh, make people more aware that they could use their organic waste. And, um, you know, there are lots of community gardens around that, that folks could, I would, you know, I would take my organic waste to community garden. I just hadn't occurred to me. Yeah, for all you people who live in West Asheville, there's a community garden in, in West Asheville. And in light of community gardens, we discussed, um, the community garden they have at Grace Covenant or Presbyterian Church and partnering with them to either, you know, help with the garden, figure out how they compost. I'm sure they probably do. Mm -hmm. um, and that would be a good partnership between us and them. That's a great idea. We also One question about that would be, uh, how how compo composted do, do the materials need to be before they're delivered to such a place? Some of us live in the wilds where composting is difficult because of wildlife that is attracted to it. Um, so if I could just take my banana peel, throw it in, that'd be one thing. But if I have to compost it for six weeks or longer before it can be delivered, I've got a problem. We talked about... Um advocating to to the to the uh, local government to um, provide because that makes this this option available to everybody if, if if we have a compost thing along with our trash then and and then it's everybody can do it you don't have to have transportation you don't have to have money to pay for compost now to come pick up your compost so um, I think that's another another thought so there'll be a third bin out front next to your recycle and your trash bin. Oh, but maybe we could get rid of that trash bin. What would we be, what would we be putting in there? Mm. <laughs> packaging. I know, packaging. Yeah, there's not much. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Um, uh, just attention to the chat. Um, Scott has put in there uh, one possibility would be if the Creation Care Committee could help provide a list of local restaurants that compost and our focus on providing takeout items um, like in compostable, you know, takeout containers. Yeah, that's great. Restaurants in Asheville, some of them are getting close to 100% compostable. That would be helpful. Maybe soliciting, you know, folks like the Kesslers that could 
uh, let us know what restaurants they know of, but maybe compiling a list for all of us would be great. Mm -hmm. And just right. in asking, uh, you know, our favorite restaurant, we start going back to it, you know, have they thought of composting? Mm -hmm. yes. you know, we'd like to support them in composting. And if they're, and also if they're using compostable takeout containers, ask them if they take those containers back and compost them. If you don't, if you don't, aren't able to do it at your home, because you know if you compostable containers aren't really worth much if they're going to end up in the landfill. Right. Well, and if restaurants get more business, you know, and the support from their trouble of composting or using compostable containers, you know, that that's, that's a, a reinforcement to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great, I see Kathy's put in on the chat, generate a list of community gardens, that would be helpful too. Mm -hmm. And possibly um, that suggestion of advocating for uh, you know, community-wide pickup of compost, is that to city council or, um, you know, who, who would we direct that request to? That was It would definitely need to go to city council. Mm -hmm. And I know that there are, there are restaurant owners, there's UNCA, they're all interested in that. So um, we just need somebody to, <laughs> to fan flames to get that, to get that uh, initiative started. And then we, and make it easier for us just to participate rather than they have to, you know, lead the whole thing. Right. Well, an education about composting, the 51% blew my mind, um, you know, as well as how you do it. Mm -hmm. We've got about another uh, minute or so before time to close down. Uh, do we know anything about the oh. public schools? Do they? No, UNCA, you're saying compost. We know if the public schools are composting. Yes, yeah, Scott can answer that. Uh, Buncombe County Schools does not. And it, it crushes my soul at lunchtime to see all the styrofoam trays that are mm -hmm. delivered to all the classrooms because we cannot gather in the cafeteria anymore, mm. uh, being thrown into uh, the large plastic bags, um, sometimes half full of food. Um, and you know, unopened milk containers just being tossed in there too. Uh, so a lot of progress needs to be made for school systems, you know, but it's a, you know, a government entity. So any change is going to be super slow. Um, but it definitely can start in the classroom, just educating the kids. I know I was an avid recycler from elementary school and got my family to start recycling because I learned about it at school and said, hey, we should do this thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so like getting kids to now have a wave of composting and try to get them to compost at home, that's uh, the impact we can make in the immediate opposed to trying to change the school system. Thank you, Scott. Okay, I think we're at time. We are. And um, I just wanted to thank you all um, for for contributing because I have a long list of ideas of what, um, from you, of what um, the creation care team can do to advance advance this composting idea. So um, we do have a closing prayer and that um, Esther will, will um, lead us in. Get my correct glasses on here. Um, this is a prayer that comes from the United Nations Environmental Sabbath Program. Let's pray. Great Spirit, whose dry lands thirst, help us to find the way to refresh your lands. We pray for your power to refresh your lands. Great Spirit, whose waters are choked with debris and pollution, Help us to find the way to cleanse your waters. We pray for your knowledge to find the way to cleanse the waters. Great Spirit, whose beautiful earth grows ugly with misuse, 
Help us to find the way to restore beauty to your handiwork. We pray for your strength to restore the beauty of your handiwork. Great Spirit, whose creatures are being destroyed, help us to find a way to replenish them. We pray for your power to replenish the earth. Great Spirit, whose gifts to us are being lost in selfishness and corruption, help us to find the way to restore our humanity. We pray for your wisdom to find the way to restore our humanity. Amen. Thank you, Esther. I want to thank the committee for all of your contributions for leadership this morning. It's been great to hear from so many of you. Um, also, just a quick announcement to <clears throat> let you know that if you haven't had a chance to sign up yet for worship and are interested in attending in May, um, that email went out this week with um, opportunities to um, sign up. We you know, understand if you're not ready and comfortable yet, but um, encourage you, if you are, to, to go ahead and, and look at the availability for reservations. Let me or any of the staff know if you have any questions about that. But next Sunday, we have a great faith formation series starting um, that Julie Esther will be leading. Um, we're all called to um, ministry with uh, children and youth, and we will be exploring uh, what that call looks like and how we can help fulfill that call um, for the next four Sundays in May. So hope to see you on the class. Thank you all, and um, have a good rest of your Sunday. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Hi, Raynan. Good to see you, Raynan. <laughs>